training on how to protect student privacy. My name is Amelia Vance, and I'm the Director of Youth and Education Privacy at the Future of Privacy Forum. And we're really excited today to talk about how to understand different ways to evaluate and manage student privacy risks and weigh those risks against the benefits to students. So we're gonna get into some risk benefit analysis here, and I don't want you to be scared off by this list of questions. So we're gonna see it more than once during this short training session. So when we're doing risk benefit analysis, we're obviously looking at what the potential benefits are. There aren't proven benefits yet, so what might those benefits be? What are the potential privacy risks? Who might benefit overall by this data being used, by this tech being adopted? Whose privacy is potentially at risk? For those of you who watched the last training about contextual privacy and edge cases, are there any of those categories that may be more at risk? What is the anticipated size or scope of the potential benefit and the likelihood that the benefits will occur? And what is the likelihood that any of those privacy risks, which we talked about during one of the previous trainings, will occur? How can you lower or eliminate the privacy risks? And we'll talk about that in just a second. What is the likelihood that you will successfully lower or eliminate them? And how might lowering or eliminating some of the privacy risks affect the potential benefits? Using answers to the above questions, you then compare the benefits to the risks. As I said, don't get too overwhelmed. We're going to go through all of this. So let's talk about what we mean by benefits. You are making a decision in this hypothetical scenario here. You're deciding to collect some new data about your students. Maybe you're thinking about a survey of where they are emotionally after engaging in remote learning during the pandemic. Maybe you're thinking about adopting a new technology that will allow students to socialize with their peers while learning. Maybe a way for students to better learn math or reading skills. Whatever you're thinking about, you want to look at the benefits and see if, among other benefits, it can be used to, for example, accurately assess student engagement, performance, or progress. So is it, for example, helping you identify your students' skill gaps or better ways to help them learn? Is it changing or supporting you in making evidence-based instructional choices? Basically, when it comes down to it, whatever choice you're making here, how is it supporting that student? How is it furthering and helping a particular student in your class? How is it helping more than that student, other students in your class? And that's where you can sort of start to evaluate these benefits. So in addition to benefits to you, what are the benefits of whatever you're thinking of doing beyond your classroom? So research is often incredibly valuable in education. So the only reason that we know that there were major equity issues with how zero tolerance discipline policies uh, were being implemented, the fact that they were disproportionately affecting minority students and getting suspended or expelled, that was through data collection. That was through research. We've also seen research in several other areas, such as finding that deeper learning instruction, so instruction on critical thinking, communication, collaboration, and learning how to learn, all of that promoted on-time school graduation and increased four-year college enrollment. In one college, they did an analysis of 2.5 million grades of former students to learn what could trip up current students and used this information 
to create an early warning system to catch at-risk students before they fail. This analysis prompted school advisors to meet with students one-on-one -on -one and create a more appropriate course list. And six-year graduation rates for the school increased from 32 to 54%, conferring 30% more degrees in 2013 than they had five years earlier. Data can be really valuable and the benefit doesn't have to be directly to those in your class or to you to be useful. So look not only to direct benefits, but possible benefits beyond your classroom that may exist. And then when we're looking at risk, what are the different ways that you could manage it? Risk management, you could not do it. Whatever it is, don't adopt it, don't do the survey, don't adopt the tech, just don't. One option. You could reduce the likelihood or the amount of risk. So if there's a technology you're thinking of using with your students, maybe you have one master account that you have all of them use. If you're sharing a video, maybe you share it on a platform that doesn't have any advertising that tracks users or you post it within a learning management system instead of outside that system. Uh, all of that could help reduce risk from some of the different risks that we've talked about before. Maybe you share outsource the risk. So get help from administrators, uh, work with your IT office to vet ed tech products, all of that. Or if something's important enough, you accept the risk and plan accordingly. So figuring out exactly, you know, how much of a risk it is. And if it's fairly minimal and the benefits are massive, maybe you just say, this is worth it. Or maybe you say, you know, I think this is worth it, but I'm not sure. And you go to parents and get consent and you plan accordingly, outsource the risk a little by getting consent and can move forward with whatever it is. So I talked about this a little bit already. It might look like using a different system, not using certain aspects of a system, deciding not to collect or enter certain types of data, reducing how long information is kept, offering students or parents an opportunity to opt out if possible, or helping them to use a particular technology in a more privacy protective way adding additional security measures, um, providing training to your students, to perhaps uh, other you know, student teachers or others in your classroom and those who you work with to minimize the risks, adding some policies or processes uh, for your students or others, or asking your district to have, for example, a technology company sign a privacy protective contract. So we're back to this checklist now, and hopefully it's a little bit less intimidating. What are the benefits? What are the risks? Who might benefit? Whose privacy is at risk? What is the anticipated size or scope of the benefits? What is the likelihood that either the benefits or the risks will occur? How do you lower or eliminate some of those risks? What is the likelihood that you'll successfully lower or eliminate the risks? How might lowering or, or eliminating privacy risks affect the benefit? For example, if you collect less data, maybe that also means that you get a lower benefit. And then using your answers, compare the benefits to the risk. And this is sort of our chart of whether you should probably stop, maybe move forward, or move forward for sure. If you have, for example, low ben benefit and a high risk, why would you do it? Why would you move forward? Whereas if you have a low benefit and a low risk, maybe you move forward. If you have a high benefit, but also a high risk, maybe that's probably one you, you wanna get an administrator involved. But if you have a high benefit and a low risk, it's something where you might want to move forward. So what are some best practices in looking at all of this? Focused on, on the best interests of each student. Try to minimize 
how much information is collected in the first place, uh, how much information is kept, when can information be deleted that's not necessary. Uh, note that you may have record retention laws. <laughs> Make sure you check in with administration first. Um, and uh, try and make sure that any product you're using, any technology, um, just minimize the amount of information. Information that doesn't exist can't be breached or can't be shared inappropriately, can't be used to embarrass a student or harm their future. So think about minimizing that information that you're collecting or how long you keep information in the first place. Be transparent. Make sure that you're talking to parents and students about the benefits and risks and including their voices and thinking about what to adopt. Make sure that ed tech is checked out for privacy and security. We'll talk about this in further trainings, but should be checked before adoption, during setup, and during and after use. It doesn't really stop. You want to check settings, make sure that students are using it appropriately, Make sure that someone hasn't messed up and is now using it inappropriately or doing something that shares personal information, either theirs or someone else's. Um, it's all very important uh, as you're adopting technology uh, that you're very careful about privacy and security. And there are many ways and many best practices in how to do that. Again, limit data minimization, but in this case, limit data sharing. The number of copies of information means that there are, you know, the fewer copies there are, the fewer copies that can be at risk. So limit who you share information with. Make sure that they need to know the information versus maybe just want to know the information. But make sure again, going back to our first bullet there, that you're focusing on the best interest of each student. Because the best interest of each student would say that Yes, you should share data with an after-school tutor or a volunteer to help a particular student move forward in their education and balance that against perhaps a risk from data sharing. Compare these risks and benefits and continue to think about them as you move forward throughout the training. Finally, embed privacy lessons throughout your teaching. Privacy isn't standalone. We have a training on teaching your own students privacy and security lessons. And it's something that can happen throughout any course. It's very important that your students know how best to protect their own privacy and security. So an example before we go into an activity of potential risks and measuring those risks so here are some risks of, for example, e-commerce personalization. You can tell this is a paper written a little while ago. Um, but this is a paper talking about online marketing and targeted advertising. And it talks about things like a risk of unsolicited marketing, computer figuring things out about me, price discrimination, it then, you know, provides specific examples of consequences. So from unsolicited marketing, you could get unwanted email, time wasted. You could have employees of a personalized website, employees of companies to whom marketing lists are sold. All of those people might now get your information. And that's just from the risk of unsolicited marketing. You can take a look at more of these examples of risk, possible consequences, and people to whom personal information might be exposed in the slides. Here's some more examples from this paper on the privacy risks of e-commerce personalization. So a risk of information revealed to other users of the same computer, for example, one of my friends always jokes about buying a copy of Fifty Shades of Grey and the ads that they received on Amazon after doing so. Uh, so that may be a, a particularly good example of how that risk could play out, uh, though perhaps not necessarily potential consequences. I think his wife just made fun of him a little bit for it. Examples of parties, other users of the computer, such as family members or coworkers. 
could find out. Um, subpoenas, government surveillance, you could have unauthorized access to accounts. So we have these examples now of risk, examples of potential consequences, and examples of people to whom personal information might be exposed. So let's move to our activity. You're going to fill in your own version of the chart. So for each of these little scenarios, which describe what is happening, you're going to list some privacy risks and possible consequences and examples of parties to whom personal information might be exposed. Have you already forgotten our common privacy concerns from the last training? No worries. We've got them right here for you. So as a reminder, we have commercialization, age and appropriate content, physical or mental safety, discrimination and equity concerns, loss of opportunity, uh, social harm or social detriment being made fun of, cyberbullied, et cetera, and over surveillance. All right, and back to our activity, the first half of two parts. So in these four scenarios, we have different things that are happening that could pose privacy risks. So for example, a picture of the school choir singing is posted on social media. What privacy risks might that raise? What are some potential consequences? And what are examples of people to whom personal information is now exposed? How could that be harmful? You can pause the video now to fill in the chart. All right, welcome back. Now we're gonna go to the second half of the activity. So you've looked at the risks and who might see information, what are some potential consequences. Now we're gonna add the other side of the equation and add ways to manage the privacy risks and possible consequences. So here are our same four scenarios. What are examples of potential benefits to weigh against risks or consequences? And what are examples of ways to manage those risks and possible consequences? You can now pause the video to complete the rest of this activity. Thank you so much for joining this training.